pretty pretty, doesn't it, sometimes? Just hear our voices. But I also enjoyed the instruments, and I was, th I was thinking that while you guys were playing, that we are really blessed to have talented people leading us uh, in song, and it uh, adds a lot to our worship. And we all add a lot when you get that acapella sound really, really pretty too. So it's easy to skip by and forget about Memorial Day if you've not been in the service. How many, how many people have been in service, military service? One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you for your service and thank you that and we're, we thank God that you're here with us because this is a day that we uh, remember those who have fallen in service, right? It, it, water's kind of get muddied because people go visit the graves of their relatives who weren't necessarily in service, but, uh, but it's a day that we use to remember those who have uh, died in military service for our country. We've had such a long period period of peace. Uh, I shouldn't say peace, but we're untouched here in our country, and so it's kind of hard. It's easy for us to take that for granted, so I, uh, I do that. Um, look at it as a long weekend, and that's about it uh, sometimes. I have to be reminded, so there is a purpose for this. Turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 2. This morning we are looking at the second of five solas, five alone statements that came out of the Reformation, five themes, doctrinal themes that were hidden, obscured, corrupted, and, and, uh, and therefore hidden, and now, uh, because of the Reformation, recovered. And I noticed, I don't know if the guys actually picked out the, the songs that we were singing earlier. I noticed how often Grace Alone. I yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know if they knew which one I was going to do next, but uh, Grace Alone, Grace Alone, Grace Alone, that was uh, that one song repeated again and again. Um, but also, it is, it is something that Protestants sing about, isn't it? The fact that we're saved by Grace Alone. Ephesians 2, uh, verses 1 through 10. Let's read that, and then we'll open in prayer. If you, do, if you don't have a Bible, please look for one, because we are going to be looking specifically at the page, and, and I want you to see at, on the page where things are and be able to uh, track and see for yourself. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you uh, that we are able to gather around and look at your word and to hear you speak to us through that, through that word, word on, words on the page. Father, I pray that you help each one of us to, to see clearly this morning something that every one of us struggle with uh, at times from one degree or another. Uh, we want to have something to do with our salvation. We want to somehow deserve a portion of it. We somehow want to be standing before you because of, even if it's just a little bit of something that we have done. Help us, Father, to understand that we stand before you undeserving. 
But because of your love for us, because of your rich mercy, we do stand before you. And you love us. We thank you for that, Father. Help us to see that uh, we are the ones in need. And you are the ones, you are the one who saved us. You are the one who is reaching out to us. Father, I pray that you help us to, to understand this, uh, to, to grasp the, the centrality of this message, the, the importance of it. Uh, if we try to include works, we line ourselves up with every other false religion. Father, I pray that you help us to understand uh, your grace is totally, totally undeserved on our part. Your mercy is. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the main portion of our text this morning is Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. But if you'll notice, this is one beautiful flow of thought from verse 1 down through verse 10. Notice quickly before we begin how it starts. Verses 1 through 3, if you look at it, there begins with death and sin. It begins with walking in, after the world, walking after the devil. And it ends, look down at verse 10, with his people being alive, not dead, responding to God, walking, not after the world, not after Satan, but walking in the good works that God has prepared for them. This is a, this is a perfect flow of thought. And along the way, verses 5 and 6, we see what happened. There's three verbs there. We were, by God, made alive. We were raised up, and we were seated with Him. As you move a little further, you see that you and I had absolutely nothing to do with it. That it was by grace. Two times. Verse 5, verse 8. It is the, the gift. The gift of God. So we're looking, as I said earlier, at the, the second of the five solas, the five doctrinal themes that were recovered during the Protestant Reformation, five teachings that were lost during those dark ages. And remember that there was a central question at the core of the Reformation. And that question was, how does a person get right with God? Last week we started with sola scriptura, Scripture alone. We go to Scripture and we go to Scripture alone in order to get the answer to that question. Scripture is the authority on all things concerning faith. All of the, the wonderful truths, all of the precious promises that come to us from, from God come to us from His Word. So that's why we started last week with Sola Scriptura. I noticed if you do an image search on Sola Scriptura, you'll see some, on, on, on the five solas, you'll see that some people have them in a different order. But several people do put them in, in the order of Scripture first. This is the source of the information that we go to when we want that question answered. How does a person get right with God? This is how the, the Reformers, think about this, this is how the Reformers uh, recovered authentic Christianity. The true message of the Gospel. They went to Scripture. So according to Scripture alone, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and for the glory of God alone. So saved by grace alone. But look at where we begin. Look at verses 1 through 3 of Ephesians 2. We begin by recognizing that we are dead in our sins. <laughs> Quick little outline of verses 1 through 3. One word for each. It's dead, disobedient, and doomed. <laughs> Right from the page there. Dead, disobedient, and doomed. We begin with total depravity, don't we? Recognizing our great need. If we are saved by unmerited favor, why is it unmerited? Because we are dead in our sins. Unable to respond. Look at, look at that word, dead. You were dead. A dead person cannot respond, can they? In fact, we, we say when someone dies, he's gone. She's gone. So there's no, nothing there that's going to respond to us. Separated. 
That's where we start out when we're looking at chapter 2. They're separated from God by sin, in bondage, and therefore doomed. Doomed. Think about that. This is what so many people do not understand. So many people do not want to believe that their sin has made them enemies of God. So many people want to, want to see God as the, the loving grandpa in heaven who's only there to dole out good things, only there to love them and shower them with blessings. But that is not the picture that Scripture gives us, is it? One day God is going to judge the world. One day God is going to judge individuals. His wrath is going to be poured out, isn't it? Last Thursday, our small group, we began looking at one of Paul's first recorded sermons, or one of the sermons where you get a, a gist of, of what he said in his sermons. He ended that sermon with a warning. A warning of coming and sure judgment. He says there in Acts 13, verses 40 and 41, Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. And then he quotes from Habakkuk. Remember the book of Habakkuk. The prophet Habakkuk was saying, Look at all of this evil. Look at all of these horrible things being done. And God, you seem to be absent. You seem to not be aware of what's happening. When, God, are you going to act when are you going to do something? And if you remember in Habakkuk, there was uh, several of us here this morning. He totally went through it and stole my thunder, but not really, because he did a great job of just really explaining uh, Habakkuk. And God said to Habakkuk, Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. And he goes on to say, I'm doing a work in your day. I am raising up the Chaldeans, a horrible, menacing, ungodly, powerful people, and I'm going to bring them and use them like a hammer on you, on your nation. He says, I'm, I'm going to bring judgment that you cannot believe, that many people do not want to believe God would be responsible for. But he says, that's what I'm bringing. God's judgment is coming. Down through history, we've seen God promise that judgment. We've seen it come, and He keeps promising a day, right? A great day of His wrath that's coming. It's going to be poured out. People don't want to believe that God will, will judge them. They don't want to think that uh, He'll be too harsh. Maybe he'll, he'll judge on a curve, and I'm really not all that bad. <laughs> Surely he'll see that. But again, we need to go to Scripture alone, don't we? For our information. And that tells us that everyone that is not covered by the blood of Christ, wearing his righteousness by faith, they will receive that wrath. Everyone outside of those who believe in Jesus Christ and trust in him for their salvation are the enemies of God and will receive that wrath. That is a horrible, horrible spot to be in, and that's where Paul, writing to the Ephesians, begins. He says, you were. This is where you were. This is who you were. But look at verse 4. Wonderful two words that begin that verse. But God. <laughs> Doesn't start off saying, but some people pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. It doesn't say, but some people listened to God and did what He said. Now, God is the one who is acting here. It says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. Notice, notice Paul repeating that again. He's wanting to make, make it clear. Do you understand where you were? Do you understand your position? You're not doing a lot better now and getting closer to God and you're coming around and God reaches into your life. No, even when you were still dead in your trespasses, dead and unable to respond, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us. And look at that made us alive. God did. 
made us alive together with Christ. Today's English version says this, but God's mercy is so abundant. Mercy uh, with withholding that which you deserve. Okay, His mercy is so abundant and His love for us is so great that while we were spiritually dead in our disobedience, He brought us to life with Christ. It is by God's grace that you have been saved. Don't you love that? And you see it several times in Scripture. But God. God stepped in. God intervened. When we could do nothing. When we were helpless. We were dead in our sins. But God. We were in bondage. Following the prince of the power of the air. But, but God stepped in. We were by nature children of wrath. We were, we were destined for, for wrath. But God stepped in. And that is the good news of the gospel, isn't it? That is the great news of the gospel. That it's not, uh, yeah, I, I'm an exception. I see things that other people don't see. No, we were all dead. And God made us alive. The gospel of justification by faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from the works of the law. And received by faith. Look at, look at what God has done. We have been made alive. There's a classic text in uh, John chapter 3. read this morning, part of it at least, where Jesus teaches about this. Where, where Jesus is teaching, talking to the greatest rabbi alive at the time. He refers to Nicodemus as, as um, the teacher of Israel. Are you not the teacher of Israel? And he's talking on the topic of salvation, very much like the, the question that we're looking at here. How can a person be made right with God? He says to him, do you, if you want to see the kingdom of God, he says, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you have to be born again. I remember a conservative political commentator that I was listening to uh, defining being born again. And I say this several times as I'm listening to politicians speak on theology. It's like, stick to politics. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. Because he, he began to wax elo elo eloquent and, and started to talk to the other guys he was talking to. Do you know what born again means? He said, it, born again means someone who came to the faith and was a Christian but left the faith and have now come back to the faith. And I was like, wow, did you miss that? You came up with that on, on your own. <laughs> It seems like Nicodemus was just about as lost, just about as ignorant, though, as this political commentary, commentator. Because Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he's old? Nicodemus is like, I'm, I'm not tracking with you at all. What does being born again mean? And Jesus is speaking about being born from ab above, isn't he? Your physical birth is your first birth. And you are born, we are born spiritually dead. Born enemies with God, right? But then we need the Holy Spirit to quicken us. We need the Holy Spirit to awaken us. To, to make us alive. And therefore then we are born again. Born from above. Born anew, right? And that's what Paul is saying here in Ephesians 2. But God made us alive. He did it. And a lot of people are very offended by this, and they want to be the one who saved the day. They want to be the one who's the hero. They wanted to read something like, but Troy was different. But Troy chose God. Troy was smart. Troy was faithful. Now, if you're still, if you're there in Ephesians, look over, look at chapter 1, verse 4. If we think, well, I chose God. Look at verse 4. Even as He, God, chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. I did not choose God. He chose me. And He chose me before I ever had a chance to make a choice. Before the foundation of the world. Look at verse 6 in, verse, in chapter 1. It is to the praise of His glorious grace. And this is confusing, isn't it? 
Because we see all through Scripture a responsibility on man's part, on, on a person's part. You have a, there is a call going out to you to receive this, to come to Him. But at the same time, we're told we've been chosen. It's, 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 there's a lot of tension here, but that does not mean that we strike what we don't understand or that we alter what we don't understand or that we redefine words that are clearly defined to fit our understanding that I chose Him. We have to see. We have to see both truths here. I remember MacArthur's, one of MacArthur's sermon. The whole sermon was nothing but, I want you to see both truths. I want you to see both of these truths quoted in Scripture. And at the end, that's all I want you to see. There are two truths here. In fact, turn over to Philippians 2. Just a page or two to the right. A page or two to the right. Uh, Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Paul says, and, and here's where we see these two together in one sentence. <laughs> he says, Therefore, my beloved, in verse 12, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. First notice, your own. You already possess it. This salvation is yours. And then notice, it is God who is working in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Somehow this works together. And uh, the great theologians look at it and say, we don't know how it works together. And when people say, oh, well, I can show you how, they always try to redefine a word. And it seems like they always are trying to go back to, I had something to do with it. But God made us alive by grace, undeserved, unmerited favor, you have been saved by grace alone. And He raised us up. Look back at Ephesians again. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. And raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. A reference to the resurrection of Christ. We are made alive together with Christ. And see verse 6 uh, of chapter 2. And raised us up with Him. As we've been moving through Acts on, in our small group, we, we see the, the apostles uh, saw the resurrection as being tremendously important again and again and again. It, it, was, it was in their discussion, in their evangelism. And I see it, and I'm sure you see it too, as, as very, very important. What a beautiful truth for the Christian. Think about this. Death is not the end. Death is the doorway. It's the doorway that when a, when a Christian dies, we step into the very real presence of our God. The one who knows us, the one who loves us. And that's important, isn't it? The one who knows us. He knows my failings. He knows my weaknesses. He knows my disobedience. But He loves us. Step into the presence of the one who died for you. And what Paul is saying here in Ephesians is the child of God is in union with Christ. We see that really emphasized here. When you place your faith in, in Jesus Christ, you are in union with Him, in Christ. That, that phrase that we kind of skip over, it sounds like Bible speak, it sounds, you know, it's kind of different. But think about Paul using that phrase again and again and again. When you place your faith in Him, the Holy Spirit places you in Him, and you are covered by Him, and you are with Him, always with Him, aren't you? Raised up, seated with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Don't you love that, that there is a citizenship that you have as a believer if, if you've placed your faith in Him? This is not a, a blanket statement for all humans. This is for those who trust Him. This is for those who've placed their faith in Him. You have a citizenship in heaven where Christ is. 
I'm a citizen of the state of Missouri in the United States, but I also have a second home. I don't know exactly how that works. Christ said, I go to prepare a place for you. Has it taken him all this time to prepare it? Is he still working on it? Is it still being built, constructed? One day it's going to come down. But I know one thing is I have a citizenship there. Our names are there. This has a lot to do with our identity, doesn't it? People today, especially today, within the last three, four years, are so confused about their identity, about who they are, what they are. If you are a child of God, if you love Jesus, trust Jesus, place your faith in Him, this, this is who you are. You have been made alive together with Christ. You've been born from above. You've been raised up and seated with Him in the heavenly places. You are in union with Jesus Christ. And this is something that God has done, Scripture tells us. Why did He do it? We see that answered several times. But God, verse 4, being rich in mercy. Again, we, we don't just look at that word and bypass it. You deserve, I deserve wrath. We deserve judgment. We were the enemies of God, are the enemies of God until He extends His mercy. But God, being rich in mercy, and secondly, because of the great love with which He loved us. Again, we have a, we have a hard time with this. We want to deserve this because of something good that we've done. Because we chose Him. Remember, though, we did not choose Him. And what we deserve is His wrath. And He in love is withholding that. This is the explanation the Scripture gives us. God is rich in mercy. He is abundant in mercy. And He does not give us what we deserve. When justice would have condemned us, and God is just, isn't He? God withheld. And God poured out His love. Next we have to ask, how did God do this? And the answer is by grace. Okay, by grace. Look at 2, 8, and 9 again. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. David Crane used to always remind us of the acronym for grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. God's, I've heard it also, great riches. I like God's riches because that's even greater than great, isn't it? <laughs> All the riches that God wants to pour out on us, desires to, will pour out on us, are poured out on us at Christ's expense. He went and died. He first lived the perfect life that we could live. Then He died on the cross taking our punishment at His expense. We are covered by God's riches. And these are ours through faith. Faith is how we receive this, by trusting, not by doing. Notice Paul says that. He says, look at it there. He says, and this is not your own doing. What does this refer to? Is he going back and talking about grace? Well, that would be redundant, wouldn't it? Because grace, by definition, is undeserved favor. Now he's referring to faith. Even faith is given to us. We've been saved by undeserved favor, by grace, through faith. And this, faith, is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. A story is told of a, a man who came uh, very eagerly, but also very late to a revival meeting. And the men were tearing down the tents and, uh, that the, the meetings were held in. And he's frantic at, at missing this event. And he asked one of the workmen how, what he had to do in order to be saved. And the man tearing down the tent, who was a Christian, said, you can't do anything, it's too late. And the man, in a panic, horrified, said, what, what do you mean, how can it be too late? And he said, the work has already been done. All you have to do is believe. All you have to do is trust. It's not a result of works, so that no one may boast. 
And we boast, we boast when we say, I've chosen God. Martin Luther said, if anyone could have ever been saved, if anyone could have ever gained heaven by monkery, by monastic practices, he said, it would have been me. <laughs> Sounds like Paul, doesn't it? Doing all the things that monks were supposed to do, confessing every sin, every little, little picadillo. He would confess, 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 and drive the priest crazy and then leave and then come running back again. And the priest saying, stop, because he remembered even the tiniest one. He was trying to do everything he was supposed to do. By grace, through faith, not of works, not by human effort. So we are saved by Jesus and faith in Him, trust in Him, plus nothing. When we add to it, we barge in and say, He did not do enough. Augustus Toplady understood this well. He captured it in his hymn, Rock of Ages, and I think I've discovered there are several different versions of this out there. Um, I have a memory that, that kind of goes along with this. Um, you know how you have memories from your early, early childhood, and it, just a snippet here and a snippet here. I have two memories. Um, we were on, a, on the Lake of the Ozarks in a John boat, a small John boat with my family of five and my grandma and grandpa, moving pretty quick through the water. I remember the, the holding on to the gunwale, is that what you call it, with the water spraying on me. That's one memory. And then I remember being under a huge rock. There was a, a storm. I can, I can remember the thunder and the lightning and the wind and just, I mean, the wind being whipped on us where we were. But they pulled the boat up to a spot where there was a huge uh, shelf, a rock shelf coming out over, almost over the water. And we pulled up and we walked up in there. It was a tall ceiling as big as a house. And there we were protected by that from the storm as, as it went on. And that's what Toplady experienced. He, he was walking home. The, the story goes, and some people doubt the story. They say, historically, we don't know if this is really what brought on this hymn. But he was walking along and a bad thunderstorm came and a, a rock wall with a with a cleft in it with a with a void in it with a with a spot in it so that he could get in there and hide and shelter from from the storm and it made him think about the wound of Christ uh, the wound in his side when the soldier ran the spear into him listen listen to these words and listen to this emphasis on it's not what I've done it's what you've done rock of ages cleft for me let me hide myself in thee let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite? No. Meaning, you know, zealous nonstop. Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I soar to worlds unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. That's good news, isn't it? It's not good news to say that's required in a little bit more because how much more is required? Christ said it is finished, paid in full, right? Again, last week in our small group, Acts 13, we barely got to good portions of this. He's closing his sermon, verses 38 and 39, and he says, Let it be known to you. Here he is preaching to a bunch of Jewish uh, people in, in the synagogue. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. What a definite statement because of Jesus and what he's done. The law, we, we have to 
struggle with this and, and understand it. The law, God's commands show us how incapable we are. They are, as Paul says, a, a tutor that is constantly pointing the way, pointing to the need of a Savior. The law was not given to save us, to make us a little more presentable to God. No, it shows us our total inadequacy. In fact, Jesus, if you think about it, when He's taught on what the law really says, He says to be angry with someone, to hate someone, is murder. He says to look at a woman with lust is adultery. God is not just concerned when He says to be holy with outward actions if inside we are a mess. The soul that sins, and it's not there in the text, but it's inferred, once shall die. The soul that sins, once. The penalty is death. We stand before God only by grace. Melissa was reading a book on John Newton the other day, and she uh, written by uh, uh, oh, it's a biography of John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace. She paused in her reading and she said, "Did you know that the slave traders learned they could bring more slaves on the ship in the hull of the ship if they made them lay on their side for the whole trip?" That's horrible to think about. They made them lay on their sides for the whole trip, packed in like sardines. They were taken from their families, stolen, put on ships. Many, many I was going to say most, I don't know the number, many died because of just wanting to get as many as you could per ship. And then when they got there, they were sold into slavery and they were slaves the rest of their life. And people like John Newton were involved in that. No wonder... No wonder he said, grace is amazing. But remember, to be angry, to hate, to lust, puts us in just as bad a spot, doesn't it? A murdering, adulterers. We don't understand the depth of our sin. That's part of the problem, isn't it? We don't understand the offense that it is. Because if we did, then we would understand the need for grace. And that is the, the doctrine of sola gratia, grace alone. We need to remind ourselves of this truth every day. How does a person get right with God? It is only by grace. He has done it all. We receive this gift of grace, but it is not a result of works, so that no one has any right, any basis for boasting. John Newton, after his salvation, was greatly used by God. If you read his books, he was, uh, I think, referred to as the nation's pastor. He, he had a letter-writing ministry where people all over the country and over in England would write him letters, spiritual questions, struggles in their life, and he would spend hours a day writing answers, good, solid, biblical answers and trying to get to the heart of their problems, the real root of their spiritual problems. And God used him in such incredible, incredible ways. Look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Newton is a great picture of that. <laughs> Someone who's living this, the most, one of the most despicable, horrible lives we can imagine. And then look where God took him. And what we, have to, what we have to remember here is do not get the cart before the horse. We are dead first. We are disobedient and we are doomed. But God steps in, right? He makes us alive. He raises us up. He seats us with Christ in the heavenlies. heavenlies. He, he puts us in union with Christ. And it is only by His grace that this, is, this happened. It is the gift of God. And then... We are His workmanship. We are His poem. We are His artistic creation. And then we walk in the good works that He prepared beforehand. 
We cannot put works up at the beginning because that is the place for death, disobedience, and doom. <laughs> That's what Galatians... Real quick, let's just move over there real quick. Flip over to Galatians to the left, a page or two. Galatians 5. This is what the Galatians were dealing with. They, were, they had heard the gospel from Paul. They started well. They, they understood grace. They understood the gospel. And then some Judaizers came in. And the Judaizers came in saying, yes, Jesus is our Savior, but we also have to follow the law. Right? And look at Galatians 5, 4 and 5. He says, Paul says to them, You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Verse 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working through love. Turn over to Galatians 3, 10 through 14. And remember, this, as I said, this, the Judaizers were not saying it's not Christ, it's the law. They were saying, yes, it's Christ, and also, also obedience to the law. Galatians 3, 10 through 14. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, and pay attention to this, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. You are cursed because you cannot keep all of them. And that's what's required, all of them. Not just giving it your best effort, but doing all of them. Verse 11, Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith but the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit. How? Through faith. What made the difference? What moved us from death, disobedience, and doom to good works? It was God's mercy. It was God's love. It was God's intervention. And remember how He did that? He sent Jesus again to live the perfect life, to die on the cross for us. And he has brought us back from slavery, brought us to life. I love the progression of this. I don't know if I've ever noticed the progression from 1 to 10 as clearly as I do now in, in Ephesians. It moves from death to life, from walking after the, the world and Satan to walking in the good works that God has prepared for us. God has restored us if we've placed our faith in Him, and it is all His doing. And the question you need to ask yourself and not leave without thinking about is, do I trust Him? Do I love Him? Have I placed my faith in Him? Am I clinging to what He's done for me? Or am I letting everything else, this world, consume me? Let's pray. Father, as we look here at the words on the page and we see what You've done for us, there's nothing, nothing we can... No word of thanks seems adequate. You've done this for your glory and we are the recipients uh, of an inheritance that is unbelievable. Father, I pray that you'll help us to understand it a little more, what you've done for us. Help us to throw ourselves on you and completely trust you. Help us to walk closely with You. Help us to, to understand the value of good works. Appreciate, desire good works for our life. But help us, Father, to understand how that happens. It happens by being born anew, by being made alive, by being in union with Christ. Help us, Father, to focus on that. 
not focus on what we're doing and how that makes us presentable to you. Father, we thank you for this love that we read about. We thank you for the mercy that was extended. We pray that each one of us here will think about this. We pray that you'll open our eyes and open our ears. Help us to understand more and more. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.